Welcome, everybody. It is great to be here with you again. Uh, Wes Young here. No Andy today. He's uh, on a little bit of a break. Got Justin with us. And then I'm going to introduce a really special guest we have on today. Um, as usual, this is the From Busy to Rich podcast. Um, today, as I said, we got a special guest. And, and, and he's not only what I believe one of the preeminent thought leaders in the financial space. You should be familiar with most of his work. Most of you will be. But really, anybody that wants to live an intentional, meaningful life. And so Carl Richards, he's a C- CFP. He's the creator of the Sketch Guy column, which appeared weekly in the New York Times, uh, featured on Mar- Marketplace Money, Oprah.com, Forbes.com, frequent fin- uh, keynote speaker at financial conferences all across the world. A couple of awesome books, too. If you're taking notes and you want to write down some books to, to listen to and buy, these are, these are great. The One Page Financial Plan and Behavior Gap, uh, fantastic reads. Has a subscription-based podcast that I listen to every week, Behavior Gap Radio. And then one of the things I'm going to ask him to spend some time talking about today that I'm super excited about is the Society of Advice uh, that he has preeminent guests on that uh, that that they talk through some really intentional, meaningful, and and relevant topics uh, that you can make instantly actionable. So uh, with that, uh, Carl, I just want to say thanks for being a part of the podcast today. Wes, thanks. I'm super excited to talk to you. This is this is fun. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we we are in. This is why I thought it'd be so perfect. We're in a series right now, uh, Carl, titled The Journey to Fee-Based Financial Planning. And the subtitle of today's is Real Financial Planning. And, and what I love about this setup and is you have what I believe is is one of the best definitions where you've wrapped language around what is real financial planning. And I thought a great way to dive into today is to have you just talk a little bit about that definition and then and then let's dance into the things that that ripple off of that that are so meaningful and relevant in the advisor community. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's it's funny that um that term real financial planning happened. I don't even know how long ago this was. More than a decade ago. I was at a, a an FPA retreat event and uh Tim Maurer myself and Michael Kitsis were on a panel back then. And I said something that I was frustrated about all the news about financial advice. Cause I, you know, we always have this debate about whether we belong to a profession or an industry and people get mad if you use the word. The reality is hopefully we're becoming a profession, but we will always be part of a broader industry called the financial services industry. We just, that's where we're going to sit, unfortunately. And you know, all the news stories about what financial advice looks like. If you read the financial pornography network or you, yep. you know, the financial circus, you, you, you're not hearing yourself described. I remember feeling like, and I said that from the, the, um, the panel discussion, I said, it's like, there's this secret society of real financial planners. Yes. And, and it's funny because at retreat, uh, you, I don't know if they still do this, but you used to be able to self-organize. Like there was parts of the agenda where you could write on a board and you'd say, I'm going to meet out here by the tree, the table by the tree. And we're going to talk about this. Somebody put real financial planning on that board. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Let's go talk about it. And there were like, you know, people I had looked up to forever there, past presidents of the FPA. Like we all, and what we'd sat around saying was like, what is real financial planning. And I remember just being so surprised that I wasn't the only one that didn't know how to define it. And and then the column of the New York Times started and one of the most common questions I got was like, what is, because is it insurance sales? Is it this? Is it that? Is it like, so that's what I, you know, I've been thinking about it for a decade. And I think real financial planning to me, and who am I? Like, I don't know. I just get, I'll just, this is my definition is it, 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 it's a Venn diagram um, and one circle says use of capital, your use of capital. And that capital has an asterisk. And the asterisk says time, money, energy, and attention. So your use of capital, and those are the four forms of capital I think about most. I, mean, I think you could throw, I mean, talent could make an, uh, an yeah. argument there, but I like attention. Your use of capital aligning your use of capital with what's important to you. So the other circle says what's important to you. And that overlap, aligning your use of capital with what's important to you is how I think. And and the reason I love that definition is because it's much more expansive than, you know, money. 
And it's also, at least it suggests to my mind, that this is a never-ending process. This process of alignment is never, like, it's never going to end. Like, I'm learning new things about how I in, how I want to use my time, money, energy, and attention every day. I'm learning that things that I used to love, I don't love so much. Things that used to, I never even thought of have become incredibly important to me. And that's going to change again tomorrow. So there's this never-ending process of, of alignment and realignment of our use of capital with what's important to us. So that's how I think about real planning. I love that. And, and a couple of quotes come to mind that I think are, are so in line with that thinking. One of them is, uh, it, and I think you, you know him, uh, Chip Heath, who has written a lot of great books with his brother. Um, but I love, he wrote this, a, a plan is useful in that it's proof the planning process is taking place. The planning process is all about dancing with the right issues. And when you use the definition of real financial planning being about the alignment of the use of capital with what you really care about, what can be more important than, than the, what, what issues are more important than what you really care about in, in that alignment? So I, I love that. I think it's just a pure, a living expression of that because I, I think sometimes we hitch ourselves to, we inherit a goal. We inherit a, a way of approaching this business instead of defining it. And we spend our lives really doing a lot of work with sometimes with very good intention, but not moving in the direction of what ultimately matters most. So I, I, I love that, Carl. Yeah, it, that, that's a huge challenge. I think it's like the challenge of life. And, you know, Stephen Covey pointed to it decades ago, like you, the last thing you want to do is spend your whole life climbing a ladder only to find out it's leaning against the wrong wall. And I mean, I'm having so many of those conversations right now. It must be part of the age cohort I'm part of, but like between 45 and 55 years old, I, it's almost every week. I live in Park City, Utah. Lots of people come here for vacations. They find out about my work. They'll say, hey, I'm coming to Park City. Could we meet? I will go meet. I try to meet at the same coffee shop or on the same trail. So it like embeds the emotional patina of these conversations because I know what's happening next. They look around to make sure nobody can hear them. And they say something like, is this all there is? Right. Like I did all the things yeah. that I was told to do. And yet I'm, this doesn't feel like happy to me. And I think that is just a pointer at the, at the, the need to, to get clear. It's funny. What's important to you? The, the, that side of the Venn diagram, what's important to you? I always thought that would be the like easy part. Like we just, it turns out for almost all humans, you, we don't know. And we had Luke Burgess on the membership call. We do this monthly call. And Luke Burgess came on to talk about his book, Wanting. So good, like life-changing book about mimetic desire. We don't know what we want. Like we just, like you mentioned, we inherit goals. We, we do it because we saw it on Instagram. Like, and adults would never admit to that. Like peer pressure is for kids, but we do exactly that. And it, it can be a little more sneaky, like the neighbor buys a boat and you don't find yourself saying, I need to keep up with my neighbor. I'm going to buy a boat. But what happens is there's just this little teeny thread of permission of like, oh, if they have a boat, maybe I want a boat. And then it, like it creeps in on you. So if you can have somebody in your life, like a financial planner who can say, hey, are we sure? Like, it's fine if the boat's now more important than coaching your daughter's soccer team. Like, it's totally fine. I'm not judging I'm going to keep my values off your plan. But that's not what you told me when we first met. Yeah. Right? That's beautiful work. I, I love that. The, the, uh, I, I find all the time running up against this myself, which is why I think God has me do this for a living. So I have to hear myself talk about these things all the time. Sure. It's because I frequently, if I'm not careful, find myself trading what I want ultimately for something I can have immediately. And I, and I think sometimes it's just because I forgot about what I thought I wanted ultimately or, or I didn't do the work to actually define it in the first place, which is the scarier part to me. For sure. Both of those. And I, and I think like, look, we should be really clear about this. This is just called being human. Yeah. And like, we're all to it. There's this weird smugness that seems to enter the fight. Like as we learn more about behavioral finance, I've watched this over the last decade. Like we, learn more about behavior finance, we tend to like point at the people, the clients, and we're like, look, all those silly people making silly mistakes. Well, the reality is we we do it more than anyone. 
Yeah. And or at least as much. And it's just called being human. And so well, how do we deal with it? It's just a series of experiments, like these series of little tests and noticing like, oh, we went to movie with friends. Our goal was to connect with the friends. So why don't we go to a dark room where we don't talk to each other? Oh, that didn't work very well. What if we invite them over for dinner? You know, like, oh, I want to retire on a sailboat. Have you ever been on a sailboat? Let's try that first. You know, like just this continual, like, let's just, Let's just learn to question the assumptions we're making and then run little experiments. Hey, what? I want to start a restaurant. Have you ever had 12 people over to the house and cooked for them? Like, what if we try that? Like, I love that idea of just realizing, like, we're all in this together. We don't have any clue. We're all mimetic. Yeah. And the best way to figure it out is to pay attention and test and practice. You know, uh, Carl, the, one of the things that I find fascinating with one of the questions we often encourage advisors to ask, one of them we try and ask a much to our clients, and this typically seems to find its way in like the newer folks, I, I think, that are that first year. But the question we always ask, in addition to all the others, is, hey, what, it, what do you feel like a rich life looks like to you? Like if, if you're here, you know, even a couple of years from today, what, what, what matters to you? What's evolved that you're doing a day in the life of you? And, and, walk, and, and I almost find like giving them some markers, some Hey, do you, what do you do? You enjoy travel? Do you enjoy go? You know, going places with your kids? Do you enjoy and trying those on. But I'll tell you, and I don't know if it's because we live in Texas and it's like a hundred thousand degrees here right now. Right. Uh, but it, 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 all of them say, "Well, I'd like to have a, a you know a house in Colorado, or or sure. or, or maybe in maybe in, in your state in Utah where they because yes. the weather's nice." But then it's like, "Well, okay, have you tried that on?" Have you have you, right. you know, gone up and actually experienced it to to really get t- have some fun with it? Like this is they're so afraid of being wrong. I think sometimes that they don't they tie every decision to eternity. It's like this plan that I'm doing instead of saying yeah. let's do plan A. Let's engage in the dance. Yeah, totally. I'm really I'm really good at tying every decision to eternity. Like I buy I'm trying to buy a new mountain bike right now. I'm like, I gotta buy the bike I'm gonna keep for the rest of my life. I wrote a column about this for the Times. Like, I'm gonna hang this on the fire mantle uh, over the fireplace when I'm done with it. Yeah. Turns out it's not like, yeah. So, have you been there in the winter? Have you been there in the summer? Have you shoveled snow before? Like, uh, have you have you been like we we got we have people that yeah tons of people I know moved to St. George, Utah after this. We had record setting winter here. They all moved to St. George, but I know a lot of people that moved to St. George, Utah, because it's really warm down there. It's like like kind of Phoenix. Think of Phoenix. And now it's August and they're like, oh, I hate it down here. Like it just, 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 just wait till the, wait till January when you're warm. Like, so yeah, I think it's smart. Like, what if we just ran little tests? What if we played a game? I love the term dance with it. Like we have a phrase around here, dance with dragons. Like those things that used to be so scary, you don't have to kill them. That's right. But but they breathe fire, but they also guard the gold. Right. What if we learn to dance with them instead? Now that's 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 beautiful. I'd like to I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about the the idea of defenders versus guides as we kind of parlay into this real definition of financial planning, if you would. Yeah. So often when we think of financial planning as a I mean, the, my favorite example, Morgan Housel introduced me to this example was the Mars rover. I, and I got to get, I got to go get the numbers right. But they, they launched it. It was going to land. I think it was like, let's just call it 10 years. It might have been eight years. It's going to land eight years, 10 years later. And they, you know, when they launched it, they, 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 they said like, here's the forecasted landing date. And it was within like four hours. So it was 99.9999997% accurate. Like, that's amazing. Well, that's called physics. And what Richard Feynman said, which I think is hilarious, he said, imagine how hard physics would be if electrons had feelings. Right? And so often we come to financial planning with that expectation. We expect, because we were taught it was math. It's math. Yeah. Like, it's, it's physics. It's as close to physics as it can get turns out it's not at all like these everything about financial planning is what we call a complex complex adaptive system made up of humans and you know the markets are just a collection of humans you're human your income is based on the you know what the boss thinks like everything about it is a complex adaptive system and so when we 
when we approach financial planning, and, and this is particularly true of the planners, which I know is your audience, the advisors, you think your job is to draw the perfect 30-year line. You think your job is to re- replicate the landing of the Mars rover. That's what you think your job is. That's probably what you were told, you know, to deliver certainty, to protect against risk, to like get rid of, to get rid of um, di- diversifiable risk, right? Well, so you then you draw that line using incredible tools. And look, drawing that line is in, an, an incredibly important skill. Like you've got to be a technical rock star. Like you've got to be good. I'm not downplaying that at all. You draw that line. You say you're 97.37% confidence using Monte Carlo in the line. Like everything feels great. And then you wake up and the next day, <laughs> you know, the inheritance doesn't come. The house doesn't sell for what you thought. The market changes. There's a million things that could happen and you're off the line. So you've got a choice at that point. And this is really, really important. Like if you see yourself as a professional line drawer, then you, you naturally become a little defensive. Don't you know the 10 best day, if you miss the 10 best days of the market, like all that kind of like throwing facts and figures at people comes from that, the feeling of like, no, no, the line, like it's good. Like this is mad. But if you understand that the line was important, but it was only important because it gave me a sense of direction and a little bit of a gravitational pull, financial planning is not about getting things precisely correct today. You you can't kitsis your way into this. Yeah. <laughs> I love using kitsis as a verb. You, you you no matter how many spreadsheets you build, you're not you're never gonna be able to build a correct model. The only thing you know for sure about the financial plan you just built for a client is that it's wrong. Amen. You just don't know how yet. And so if you understand that, you become much more like a guide in the changing landscape. So instead of defending the map, you're a guide. Well, what does a guide do? I mean, I've been a guide and I've been guided in pretty crazy situations in the mountains and on rivers and oceans around the world. And, and every single time I've been, every single time I've either been a guide or been guided, something, we, we started with a really clear plan. Like we had a route drawn, we checked the weather, we did everything we could. And then absolutely every time the plan blows up. And what I've learned is that at the moments when the plan blows up, if I get defensive or scared or nervous, I mean, the only thing scarier than being in a plane with turbulence is having your pilot come on and go, hey, you know, I'm really scared right now. I mean, <laughs> or, or or say, I know you're feeling those bumps, but that's not really happening because I have the perfect plan. That's, that's the only thing. So <laughs> what, what you need from a guide is to say, hey, yeah, that's a big storm. I, I, didn't, I didn't see it coming either. Believe me, we did all the work before. It wasn't in the forecast. But now we're in it. And guess what? We're not going to be able to go where we were thought we were going to go. But I got a whole bunch. I'm a trained decision maker in the face of irreducible uncertainty. I got a whole bunch of tools in this backpack. So all we really need to know is where are we now? And what are we going to do next? And then new information is going to show up and that will help us make the next decision. So if you become, if you sort of embrace the idea that your job is to navigate irreducible uncertainty, it's not to get rid of uns. Yes, technical tools, insurance, all those things can get rid of some uncertainty. But you're still left. Risk is what's left over after you think you've thought of everything. Right. Risk is going to show up. And your job at that point is not to be defensive. It's not to feel bad. Or, and this is important because I know planners care so deeply. And then the plan doesn't work. And you feel like you did something wrong. It's not your job. Your job is now to say, yeah, yeah, it's a big storm. And it could be a positive storm, by the way. But it, it, that's a big storm. Um Let's let's get together and figure out what to do about it. I, but I'm really I want you to know I'm really good at making decisions with uh, incomplete information. Really good at it. And in fact, I got a whole process. Turns out there's all this research around how to make decisions in the face of irreducible uncertainty. Get better at that. Yeah, get better at that. That to me is such a beautiful job. And by the way, I also love calling it reality based financial planning instead of this fantasy based financial planning. I, I love that you use the idea or the concept of, of maps and using a guide. I had a, a unique background before coming into the financial services. I was actually in forces. I was a Green Beret. And a big part of what we did was land navigation and training on that. And so you'd always plan out your your 
route to the maps to what you thought was going to be like the best way to get there, right? Like, and, and we even had a, a what we call a pace plan. So you get your primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. So that if this doesn't happen, then we fall back on this. And re- regardless of the situation, to your point, like it always blows up. So what we found, and I think this, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, but but from a planning standpoint for map reading and then just financial planning, the, the importance of, we had checkpoints or phases essentially. Like we've got this idea of where we want to go and how we're going to get there, but we were really good at being able to make those course corrections like at certain points. So we could recognize here's where we are in relation to where we thought we were going to be at this point. And to your point, like, we're not caught off guard that there is a storm. We know they're going to happen. And we can make these kind of course corrections along the way to navigate. Because I've, I've traveled a long distance through mountains, similar to you, through some weird scenarios. And never once was it a straight line. I might have thought it was going to come out as a straight line. But there's a waterfall. Things happen. You get chased off by a bear. Like, it's just part of life. So it's, it's coming up with the scenarios of... of how are you putting in the, I guess, the metrics that you need or the, the phases to be able to say, where am I in relation to this so I can make a course correction and then leading clients from there? Yeah, I know. I love that. Yeah. And a lot of the good work around this navigating uncertainty comes from military doctrine, you know, sort of ODA loops mm-hmm. and the idea that, you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. All that, all that stuff is pointing to the same idea that, like, yeah, that's cute that you have a plan. And by the way, incredibly important. Like I use that phrase a lot. Like that's cute. I don't mean to be dismissive about it. It's incredibly important. And it doesn't matter at all. Like that's the cool thing. Like being a financial planner requires you to be an adult. And adults can hold two competing truths in their heads at the same time. That financial plan that you're building is incredibly important. And it's totally worthless. Yes. <laughs> right? And, and and we got to be able to hold those things in in the same time. So in terms of check in, one way I like to think about it is from the literature, the way to navigate a complex adaptive system is what we're pointing to. The way to navigate one, the only way really to navigate one, is to get really clear about where you are today, and then solve for the next. The literature says solve for the next local optimum. I love that language. That really just means make the next best step, right? Take the next step. And the the I like to think of that as a loop. Because when you take that next step, new information will show up. You know, it's just literally like physically try this sometime, you know, look really hard, like stand in a room and, you know, maybe your office at home or something. And from where you're standing, analyze everything you can possibly see, like take note of it. Like you could even write it down, then take one step forward, like one step forward and new information will show up. You'll be able to see things you couldn't see before. And but that new information only became available because you took action. And so I think that loop between where am I today? What's the next best step is, and you can play with those. Like if the next best step is too scary, make it smaller. Yeah. And then you can also play with the cycle, the throughput of that cycle. Where am I next best step? That largely is dependent on the variability of this, the volatility of the situation, right? So if you have a client with a pension, and, you know, retired, they live way below their means. Like, it, it doesn't really matter what the market does very much at all. You're meeting once a year, you're double checking, you're saying things like, could you afford to not take a cost of living increase this year? Right? Like that, that may be like your extreme adjustment, because their life is so stable. You may have another client that started a restaurant in 2019, it went super well, and they decided to raise a bunch of money in late 19 to open 11 restaurants in 2020 in the spring. They get them open and everything changed. And now you're saying to them, you call the bank, call me back in an hour. Right. And so the throughput is now like it could be like every day for six months while you're trying to help that client. So you just adjust the throughput of the where am I today? Where do I go next? Based on the volatility of the client situation, those could be timed. We have quarterly reviews. Those could be something pops up in your life. Call me, you know, and, and I think we're open to both of those. So that's how I think about that idea, the tactical piece of it. That's awesome. Um, Carl, I want to, I want to take a second and I, I'd like if you would to, to talk a little bit about the society of advice. Uh, I know uh, having got to observe it, 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 
the way I, I could see it is so beneficial to a lot of the people that are interested in this content that we're talking about here today um because they're they're running practices they're they're in varying stages some of them are are like the brand new some are in the middle and some have been doing it a long time and there's so many different aspects of things and and really i had a, a friend of mine mentioned this the other day he said you know wes what I, I i'm trying to do is prevent myself from becoming an arsonist i said well what what do you mean an arsonist he said because I find myself, I get in these modes, my mental modes, whether it's hiring people or it's a way to think about marketing or it's a way to think about, and I feel like I'm always going from one fire and putting it out to the next. And then I ask myself, maybe I'm the arsonist. Maybe it's okay. the story right. I'm telling myself that's causing right. these things. And one of the things I'd say about uh, so much of your work um, that's been personally helpful to me is it keeps me from being an arsonist in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. It, it helps like mentally and emotionally be fit to do this kind of work. And I know Society of Advice has a lot of great communicators that you bring on and have great conversations with. So if you would speak to that, because I think if there's a takeaway that I would leave everybody with today, mm-hmm. certainly is all these things we talked about, but but what could you go do that's going to help keep you <laughs> from being an arsonist or, or keep you mentally fit to where you enjoy this dance of what we get to do every day? Yeah, that's really, that's, thank you, by the way. And that's really a great analogy. I, yeah, so... Um, the, 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 the society of advice really, I started doing these, I started having conversations. One of them was actually with Dan Heath. Um, Seth Godin was one that really changed things a bit. I was having a private conversation with both of them. So I spoke at an event that Seth spoke at and we were having lunch and it was a financial advisor event. And the place we were having lunch was right outside of the main thing. And so I kept, I kept, and Seth, I heard Seth speak. And I had heard him speak earlier that week at a, at a, like a real estate or a marketing convention. And he gave the same talk, which is what you, you do. Yeah. I'm not pointing fingers at all. Like this is what you do. Then Seth and I are having lunch and I'm asking him specific questions about his work and how it relates to financial advisors. And this repeated with Dan Heath, and it happened to be in China. We were both spoken at an event in China, and we didn't really even know it until we got there. And while I'm talking to Seth, I could see advisors walking in, like, you know, like trying to listen in. <laughs> and I remember thinking, like, this conversation would be so valuable. I wish this was recorded because I was drawing out like the specifics of his work as it applies, it wasn't the general principles. So I held one of those with a guy named Jerry Colonna, who's an amazing, amazing person, amazing coach. His book is called Reboot. Um, so good. And we held it with Jerry and like 2,000 people signed up for Zoom. I did increase the thing. That's like a $5,000 call. I didn't realize that like the bandwidth of that was that much money. But I, so that's what we, so we finally, after that, I was like, well, we should formalize this. So we do that every month now. We bring somebody on. And so like this uh, September is uh, Brad Stolberg's new book, Master of Change. This is an insanely good book. And Brad's really, really good. Um, And I just have a, it's basically a private conversation between me and somebody I find interesting. And therefore, I hope you will find interesting. Sometimes they're best-selling authors. Sometimes there are people you will never have heard of that will blow your socks off. Like one of my favorite conversations ever was with my friend Travis Corrigan, who has this thing called the rejection inoculation program. And it was like (laughs) so good. And nobody would have ever heard of Travis. So every month we have that. Now that's, that's the purpose we, for what we get together, but here's what it is. And this is what you could do, whether you join the membership or not, it's $147 a month. Your first month is free. So like, it's basically risk-free. Um, you go attend a meeting, decide if you like it. Um, But independent of whether you do or not, here's what really the value is. The value is it's a 90-minute meditation on business. I don't know what I don't do and what I've been tempted to do because we could sell a a crap ton of it is like tactics and tips and tricks and shortcuts and hacks. Yeah. Here's the problem. That's a never-ending hamster wheel. Like it's it what what we're trying to do with the society is to teach people like you are the only guru that matters. You are. Because 
all we're trying to do is create space. So the live call is the thing. The 90 minutes a month on your calendar, cameras on, distractions off. Being there intentionally, what will happen is an insight will occur to you. And I'm just trying to create conversations that will spark insights. But the insight that occurs to you will be different than the person sitting next to you on Zoom. And I would never be pretend to be able to tell you what you should do. Yes. So I just think of it as a chance to work. So you don't need the membership to do that. Like set aside 90 minutes, go on a walk and ask yourself one question. Like, what should I do next? Like what, there's really two big questions. One is where do I really want to go? Like the, 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 the big stake way out there on the ground, just so you have a sense of direction. Yeah. Don't hold too tight to that. Just guess. It's fine. Then the next question is, what should I do next? What's the one thing? If I did it today, it would change my life and my business. One thing. And I'm just trying to create a space where that will happen. And we'll ask you about it in the membership call. We always say, like, what's the one thing that occurred to you today? But that's what it is. So you can do it whether you join the membership or not. Just, I think we all spend so much time looking for answers from experts and then what we do is we get the answer from the expert and we do it and we t- find out it doesn't apply to us and it's not a right thing. And then we go look for the next expert and then we see our clients do this with market forecasts. Yeah. You know, smart money's, does smart money still around? Smart money's list of 10 mutual funds that didn't work. I'll buy money magazines, you know, like you just go from one expert to the next. We spend so much time doing that. I'm just saying, what if we stopped your own intuition is the thing that actually matters the most and will be the most long lasting for you. Let's create spaces where that intuition will serve you. That's it. That's awesome. Carl, I can't thank you enough for, for being a part of what we're, we did here today. And uh, for all you who are listening, you know, you, you, I get frequent questions all the time. Hey, what's, what are you doing? What kind of things do you follow? And if you're not following, following Carl, uh, you're not doing what I'm doing. And, and I would highly recommend you go to the society of advice.com, check it out and, and, and really just use that as that moment of meditation to really keep you from being an arsonist. Um, cause we need it. We need it. All of us do. And we should enjoy this work we do. It should be fun, not full of fires. And the way you do that's keeping your head healthy. And this is a great way to do it. Carl, thank you. You're a blessing. Oh, amazing. So much fun. And thank you. Um, thanks for the work you're doing.